This is the Mooncast. What what time what time is it over there? Uh oh, ten oh four AM. Oh, ten oh four? Oh, okay, okay. You're in you're in yeah. Canada, right? Yeah, yeah, near Toronto. Oh, okay, okay. Nice, nice. How's the how's the weather right now? Actually, it's really nice. The last few days have been like perfect. Like I don't even want to. I don't even want to sit at my computer most of the day <laughs> because it's so nice. <laughs> That's right. I'm yeah. glad this is early because I'll probably go outside after. Yeah, dude, yeah. man. It's it's nice to finally meet you, man. Welcome to the Mooncast, man. Welcome, man. Um, guys, we have a very special guest today. We have the, you know, used to be formerly, you know. Cardano influencer, <laughs> I guess you could say, you know, <laughs> yeah. but you know, he's, he's transitioned now, starting to do some more things into the, the business landscape, the entrepreneurship landscape, live from his mom's basement. <laughs> that is true. That's true. <laughs> Jack Fricks, man. What is up, bro? What is up? Um, it's just nice to finally get a chance to talk to you. You know, uh, I'm curious with how your, how did your YouTube journey start? You know, um, Actually, my YouTube journey started about three years ago when I was in college and I started making videos about like make money online stuff. Um, I did that for like a year and I got monetized or whatever. So I started making money and then I found crypto and investing and I kind of just started making videos on it. I literally just my first video on crypto like a month before I found Cardano was just, you know, avoid scams and just covering the YouTube scams because they're still there. But <laughs> yeah, and then, and then I just started making videos every day, and then, uh, yeah, like eight hundred videos later on the on the crypto channel, um, here we are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how did you stumble across Cardano though? Exactly, like, was it like an influencer, or like were you doing some research? And what what year was that? Did you stumble across Cardano? Uh, actually, I stumbled across Cardano because of a YouTuber, Andre Jick um i don't uh, even know him yeah, yeah so he, yeah. he invested a bunch of money into it and at the time i was like i was very new but i didn't really know what was going on i didn't even know like the difference between bitcoin and ethereum and cardano but <laughs> i found it i looked at it i saw like you could earn money from staking every five days so i like was very interested so like oh this is cool i can put in you know a thousand dollars and every year i get this much cardano back and it's going to go up in price and you mm -hmm. know all the hype stuff you first get when you first get in something like oh it's gonna make me rich but then i liked everything also afterwards i kept enjoying you know what was the fundamentals of behind cardano and stuff so yeah and then i just kind of dove deep and i learned by actually making youtube videos i'd make so i'd, I'd try to research something and then i make a video about it and then i'd research something and make a video about it i learned that's basically what i did for like a few hundred videos and that's like how i got to where i was and where i am just by basically learning and just talking about what I learned. That's pretty much it. Damn. That's, that's nice to hear, man. So that was, that was 2021. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so. No, actually. Yeah. Yes. 2021. I think of May is when I created my channel. So it's been about, so that this channel or my main channel has been up for like two years, 800 videos. Um, but yeah, 2021 in May is when I started it. Yeah. And then I had a video really pop off because Cardano was really hype then. So it went to like 150,000 views. Um, it was like, what if you invested a thousand dollars in Cardano today? And then, then my channel like already had 5,000 subscribers to boot. And I was making videos every day from there because I was so excited. Yeah, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. How long did it take you to get to get monetized? Because um, I know a lot of people, they it takes them sometimes a year, two years. And, and for you, how long did it take you? Like six months? Um, well, my first channel that took me, I think, like about 50 or 60 videos and like, I think it was like six months. And then the second channel was like two weeks because a video really went crazy. Um, so it differs. But honestly, the YouTube AdSense kind of is crappy anyways. Like I feel like yeah. people are a lot better monetizing like themselves with their own service, their own product, affiliate links, or just yeah. like just something other than YouTube AdSense because YouTube AdSense, mm -hmm. you have to get all these views and you have to keep getting them so it kind of puts you on a hamster wheel but mm -hmm. another another topic but yeah it didn't take yeah. that long to get monetized on the second channel but i think most people will probably take them you know six months to a year just yeah. to make the first dollar 
yeah what what made you like start wanting to do youtube in the first place like what was the what was the reason behind it uh i just didn't really want to work like i guess a job was the main thing and, and also <laughs> like that was really the main thing i just didn't want to work for someone else and i saw people making money on youtube and i saw like you know people making businesses on youtube even and so i said okay i'm just gonna start trying to make videos figure it out and it's fun you know it is it is fun just to create stuff and that is basically my motto just to create stuff so that played a lot into it too just making stuff putting it out there you know what i learned was what I, all i was doing was sharing what i learned so it was fun yeah. as well which made it even better yeah what, what would you do like because i always try to ask the question because i'm also like starting to build my i have a travel channel too it's separate and i also mm -hmm. have a channel that i'm working on to post the, the podcast now too on you know i'm also have it on spotify too as well and you know i always try to ask like what what tips are like can you give to someone who's just like starting out you know doing youtube and um what would you also and also i want to ask you too as well what would you also do if youtube didn't exist like how would you figure out a way to to grow an audience and cultivate an audience would you just jump from another social media platform what would you do exactly um so on the topic of starting on youtube i think the easiest way is actually to grow like another social media channel and try to boost it um yeah. so like twitter instagram you know TikTok, something like that but honestly just making really good videos is probably the best way to grow youtube audience that people are going <laughs> to watch all the way through that's actually pretty hard to do yeah. i am kind of leaning to try to get there in the quality side of things but most of my success on youtube was just from trending topics and things that are relevant like at the time so maybe in three weeks they wouldn't be relevant but at the time people are searching for people are interested and there's no other videos on it so that's what i did if you're in crypto specifically that's kind of the approach i would take is like if you're small or you want to grow an audience you focus on the topics that maybe are more time sensitive so you can get people in the door to your channel and then post other videos like long form content stuff to just kind of grow your audience but in terms of if i, if I didn't have youtube um now that i've discovered it i would definitely just focus on e like a newsletter an email list it's so easy to get an email list and like no one can take that away from you if you have someone's email you can contact them they can unsubscribe yeah but like they're gonna get your email in their inbox and youtube if they're subscribed to you there's like a 10 percent chance they see your video and then yeah. like another like five percent chance they actually click it so I would just say even with YouTube right now, email newsletters or just an email list is like the best form of actually building and owning an audience. Yeah, no, yeah, I agree. And another thing too, people don't realize that you don't exactly, because with YouTube, there's no way to really directly contact, like you can't, they can't DM you, mm -hmm. you don't have their email and they kind of own the audience and you're just kind of leasing the uh, yeah. ability to use their platform, you know, in a sense. And I, that's the one thing I don't like about YouTube and also the the lack of transparency in regards to the earnings with the Google AdSense. You don't entirely aren't sure like what you're gonna make. Mm -hmm. You know, it fluctuates. It depends also if, if there's, for instance, if you um maybe you post a travel video, but it's peak travel season. Well, there's more ad spend, so then you'll get more mm -hmm. ad revenue. You know, as opposed to uh, a, a it's not peak travel season. Then you know, depending on what audience that you have that's watching your videos, then you get less ad spend. So it's just very very like volatile. And I think that the main thing for YouTube, the only value that it really has is the, is the fact that you're able to grow an audience and then you can leverage that audience to, you know, come join a discord, you know, join a newsletter, you know, affiliate links, you know, you can do sponsorships and you know, merch store and all these different types of different ways that you can get creative to monetize. So it's very, very interesting. And um, I want to ask you too about the editing portion. Like, are you editing all your videos yourself? Who taught you how to edit? how did you learn? Did you just learn gradually? Um, just, just talk to me about that process. Cause I'm, I'm always tweaking, trying to learn new skills with editing. So, um, yeah, l let us know, man. Yeah. So editing, I have always just edited by myself. I, I've tried to pay people for editing. Like I had this one friend that I met like on the internet playing video games. And he actually taught me a lot of like basic, like simple things on how to actually start editing. Then I just used YouTube and also, yeah, I made like so many videos. That I just kind of learned how to edit over time. And I got faster and faster and better at it. But most of my editing is just cut, paste, paste together, cut, paste together. It's not like actually, I guess, editing. There's not much post-processing effects, although I'm trying to work on that and make get that better. Um, but yeah, I learned through trial, error, 
uh, and mainly just like YouTube tutorials, like, oh, I want to learn how to do something. But editing, mm -hmm. editing is a tricky thing because you could spend like 30 minutes editing or you could spend four hours and like mm -hmm. no one no one knows how much time you spent editing the video so <laughs> it can be disheartening especially if you're posting it to youtube and like you know only 40 people watch the video that you spent so many hours making uh, mm -hmm. but yeah editing to learn those skills um or if you want to outsource it like you could do that if you kind of have a hatred for editing which i'm not a big fan of so i'm tempted to outsource it at times um, but yeah. it's hard to do either way uh, if you just want to learn though i would just say like just pick up any program and look at like a basic tutorial and just start going but yeah it's it's gonna suck at the start because like learning a new program or learning new anything new obviously is like has a pretty large learning curve at the start yeah for sure what, what about the software what software are you using for, for your editing um so I, I used to use sony vegas until like a month ago um and now i use actually completely free software it's just davinci resolve they have a free version which is actually like incredible like it's amazing yeah. so i was blown away by that if anyone's going to edit on their computer, I would just say use DaVinci Resolve or if you have a MacBook like Final Cut Pro or iMovie, those are three free programs. I don't think Final Cut's free, but three inexpensive programs that are actually like really good. So, yeah. Yeah. No, it's dope, man. It's dope. You also, didn't you launch a NFT project too as well? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, sick yeah. frick. So I actually have a hat back there. I've been wearing it lately because it's been hot out. Um, but yeah, I launched a project in 2021, September, probably like six months after my channel launched. Um, mm -hmm. That was when NFTs were like brand new to Cardano specifically. So you know, everyone was hype. Everyone was like getting really into it. Um, and yeah, I also fumbled a lot of that because I lost like 70% of my crypto to taxes. Um and that was that was interesting, but but here we are, right? We're still, we're still, <laughs> still in my mom's basement, so it's still all yeah, good. yeah. Well, can can you walk us through a little bit of the process of launching? Because actually, I just launched my NFT, my book as an NFT okay. on the Polygon blockchain. Yeah, so I'm one of the first to ever do it on the Polygon blockchain. And um, can you just walk like through the process of doing it, like on Cardano? Because some people think it's like super difficult, and like you know, you got to pay a bunch of money. But can you just walk through the process, the, the minting process? how you did it exactly, um, you know, because you did it on Cardano, right? What minting service did you use? And just kind of walk us through a little bit of that. Yeah, so I minted my NFT project at the time when there was like no infrastructure on Cardano. So it actually was pretty hard. I had, I paid a developer like 40% of the total take home of whatever, like, you know, what came in. And then he mailed a he made a website for me and we use this service. It's still available today. It's called NFT Maker or N Maker. I believe they're rebranded. It's pretty popular. Um, we mm -hmm. use that service, but at the time you still had to custom kind of code together, you know, all the assets, the randomizations and that. Um, so honestly, I don't think anymore you would need a developer because you can also use like Cardano has JPEG Studio from JPEG Store. That one I've used personally. I made a tutorial, I made tutorials videos on it actually for them. Um, they hired me to make some videos for it. Um, but yeah, that process of making NFTs on Cardano is a lot easier now. So I'm kind of outdated in like the best ways to do it. But uh, any NFT you make is going to be like easy to make, but hard to maintain, I would say. Because after like you launch it, there's a lot of expectations, right? For what is this NFT going to be used for? You know, what's, mm -hmm. the, what's the profit potential for the people who bought it? Um, and that that is probably the i'd say like the most difficult part of actually you know launching an nft collection um versus mm -hmm. like something like a book right it has immediate value like you can you know what you're doing with the book you're reading the book so yeah <laughs> yeah yeah no I, have you thought about maybe adding like a utility sort of like maybe a rev share model for your youtube channel you know maybe it incentivizes people to like share and subscribe mm -hmm. to push your content too as well have you thought about something like that um I thought about it, but it kind of immediately goes down the rabbit hole of like, you know, is this a security now? And also my YouTube channel, does it make any money really <laughs> at all? So it, it's like, at that point, it was like, uh, I don't know. And it doesn't seem very logical, but it's a good idea in theory. If you have, um, you know, really successful YouTube channel and a really successful way to actually push out content to people who want to make it, you know, push it further. Yeah um it's a good idea but i don't think i would do it yeah so you didn't so you didn't pay the developer anything you just gave him like sort of a rev share 40 percent, 60 60 percent split yeah. you did something like that yeah that so like because back then it was basically all custom like custom work custom 
codes. So I just said like percentage wise, and then um, he's more incentivized to actually work with me. It's but yeah, it was it was like for, it was forty percent, I believe, um, at the time, which was quite which is quite a bit. But um, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, that's cool, man. That's cool. Yeah, it, it's interesting because I'm wondering because you also had a stake pool running too as well. So you learned all these skills like in a short amount of time. So I'm like, mm-hmm. what, how did you learn how to run a, your own node? Like, where did you go? You went on YouTube. Like, where, what resources did you use to gather to be able to um, um, develop the node? Or did you pay a developer to help to run the node initially? And then you just kind of had it running autonomously? Or how did that work? Um, yeah, so for the Cardano stake pool, I actually did it all myself. Like, I learned how to do it um it took a while i watched some youtube videos but mainly i just went through a guide um it's on it's still up there coin cashew they have a guide on how to run a card on a stake pool and then i ran a pool on on testnet so i set up a node on testnet for about a month and made sure i know what i was doing so nothing was going too wrong uh and i also consulted with some someone in the discord um it's like nasec i believe his pool is still running on cardano um mine is now retired but his it, or he helped me at discord and there's a bunch of people in there that just like you know if i had any problems they'd be like oh do this do this do this or you can try this and then i just learned after like a basically a month and a half of like every night i would kind of go and like set things up and make sure i understood things and then i learned enough where i was comfortable launching the pool and then i just launched it which you know was me basically just sitting in my mom's basement for hours on end just trying to figure out actually how to make it operational so people could join and then i did it um then after that was really easy it was like it was like basically once or twice a month i would have to check in on it or like actually do some maintenance so after you i had the initial learning curve and i knew what i was doing it was like it's kind of just let it sit there and just pay for Mm -hmm. the servers um so yeah yeah how long did it take you initially to like learn from the moment that you started it when you started learning it to the moment that you finally were able to launch it as a mainnet sort of service for people to use and um, stake their Cardano to your stake pool? Uh, it was probably about a month and a half. And then like, so like probably three weeks of me actually like learning how to do it. And then just like a few weeks of testing and making sure like it was good. So yeah, not that long, but lo- long enough. It was many hours because um, I don't think I would have been able to do it though if I didn't have some kind of background in like tech, tech because I went to college for computer programming. So that helped, mm. um, but it's not that complicated however it's easy for someone to probably start it and then like mess up something um so it's not yeah it's definitely something that now if i was doing it something like that i'd probably outsource it because there's a lot of people that actually host services to help you do that um Mm -hmm. but back then it wasn't like that so i just did it myself why'd you shut it down Uh, i shut it down just because like one it wasn't very profitable it wasn't becoming profitable um, cause Cardano price is low and also the server costs are going up. Um, I could host it in my mom's basement, but like, then I'd have to, you know, buy the hardware and run it 24 seven, raise electrical bill. Um, and also like, I'm not fully committed, uh, to that, to Cardano network anymore. And I feel like someone mm. running a stake pool, they have, uh, you know, responsibility to actually be involved and make active decisions because as a stake pool operator, you take you know, you take part in votes, you take part in test nets to help the network grow. Mm-hmm. And I'd rather someone else have that, you know, the share of the network or that vote uh, that's more participated in the network than myself, really. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And I know, like, because I, I kind of track you a little bit and like, so all your entire 100% of your portfolio is all in Cardano, in the Cardano ecosystem, right? Uh, y- Not entirely, because I have a little bit in Ergo, but like, other than Ergo, yes. I don't have any. I think I probably have like thirty dollars of Bitcoin and like everything else is in Cardano. <laughs> <laughs> like, but yo, that is that is crazy, man. You know, uh, but I mean, I'm wondering, like, I'm just trying to pick your mind. Like, why did you choose Cardano over other? Did you study other ecosystems like Ethereum, Bitcoin? Because um, you know, Bitcoin now has you know the ability to smart contracts and all these different with the tap mm. upgrade and everything so i'm just wondering why did you choose the cardano ecosystem just to go all in on cardano was it did you see the the famous charles hoskinson whiteboard you I know did. uh explanation that. was that was that the I first did, thing yeah. that you saw that is that is like the first thing that i saw and that definitely got me um inspired to take a deeper look and honestly 
I mostly I was mostly just invested on Cardano and still am because it's like what I lived and breathed for two years, like 800 videos. So I was like, well, why would I go in anything else? I think this is going to work out. I think this is going to be something worth the value. So I just left my money there, especially because I was kind of too lazy to research or stay on top of other places, other investments. Um, and now I just kind of have forgot about my investments for the most part and not relying on them. But like they're still all in Cardano. They're still all there. I didn't sell any of it. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Were you so was it true that you were working at like like McDonald's like before all this this stuff started with make money online and everything? Yeah, I was working at McDonald's even in college, um, part time, uh, for about three years, almost three years, and then I dropped out right before I draw or I quit McDonald's like four months before I dropped out of college. And then I went like full time YouTube making like a few hundred dollars a month, but like enough mm -hmm. to pay rent. Um, and I had savings. So basically living off savings and like tiny amount of income online um, and just paying like very cheap rent in my mom's basement. But yeah, McDonald's was my only actual job, I guess, technically. <laughs> how, how was that experience for you, you know, working in that industry and, you know, uh, did you did you like it? Did you did you at least network with some people or like was it just complete garbage? I mean, it was probably good in the grand scheme of things. Not that any of like, you know, working at a fast food is going to be fun. Um, but <laughs> I, I, don't, I wouldn't say I regret it because it, it is kind of it is um, what got me to where I am. Basically, just like knowing that, OK, I don't want to do this uh, again. So so I, I don't I don't think I regret it. I think it's good. Uh, to have some kind of reference of what you do not want um, to go forward and actually pursue what you do. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it makes absolute sense, man. Yeah, I think that that people should learn hard work and discipline to some extent, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that working an actual like nine to five in a, in a job like retail or in the gastronomy industry, like these type of industries, it really, really teaches you hard work, discipline and you know, so you can learn a little bit of those soft skills and then transition that into what you actually really want to do. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's quite interesting, man. And um, yeah, so with this Discord that you've run, like how long have you been running that? And um, why did you decide to start running it? Um, wait, oh, the Discord for the Mom's Frickin' Basement, that one? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. so that, that Discord was actually originally the stick fix discord and it still is for the nft project and it's also mm -hmm. like just a place where people can come from a youtube channel to talk about like crypto and stuff um it's been pretty kind of dead ever since crypto died down you know not too many people pop in also other people in other discords uh but yeah i mainly just made it for uh you know my nft project and people who are interested in my content and what i was doing to just come in and talk that's really uh the extent of it yeah. So talk to me a little bit more about the transition from, you know, to the blockchain space. So now you're starting to evolve and transition more into the business side of things. Why did you start to take this leap to switch over? And what is it exactly that you're trying to achieve in this process? Um, so really what it comes down to um, switching like very quickly from, you know, crypto Cardano only to a more broader sense is that I just want to talk about like more things that I'm interested in other than just, you know, Cardano, because obviously it can get can can get kind of boring talking about the same thing for two years. Um, even <laughs> if I am still interested in it, obviously, there's other things that I'm interested um, in my life. So my main goal was just to make something, you know, business or uh, a platform for myself that I can talk about whatever I want or whatever's on my mind or whatever I'm curious about and have it actually like amount to something so my model now is just like to live a better life and anything could fall under that scope you know or live a better life and you know build wealth so anything could fall under that scope really that i'm going to be interested in and it's broad and it's kind of resulting in a lot of less revenue right now but i think over the long term um it's a better just approach to for myself make content on the internet rather than just focused hyper specifically on one thing even if it was working before yeah yeah no yeah it's good to always evolve and you know the, your true supporters and stuff will always go wherever you go you know and they'll they'll follow you wherever you go so it's part of the journey and you need to be uncomfortable for a little bit because the minute yeah. i feel comfortable is the minute that i know that i need to i need to switch something you know this is um i've, I've been traveling the world since i was 19 
and um, oh, damn. For, for, yeah, for, for 10 years now. And That's so, holy. yeah, man, I'm actually in Bulgaria now. So um, for me, it's always, I've always sought uncomfortability, always, you know, because uncomfortability means growth. That's, that's all it means, you know? Mm -hmm. And so for me, I'm always looking for the new thing to be uncomfortable with. And I feel like it's very, very important as a person, if you really want, you know, a, a different level, a different form of evolution for yourself and a different uh, a level up, you know, per se, then you have to sort of be bold, be brave and take those, those steps, even if they're incremental to want to put yourself out there in an uncomfortable environment in an uncomfortable industry, yeah. in an uncomfortable situation for yourself to evolve as a person. So I really, really admire that you're that you're doing that and you're evolving. And maybe some of your your subscribers and stuff might not like it. I think I did watch a couple of your latest YouTube videos as well. <laughs> and you talk about numbers don't matter. And what what did you mean by that exactly? I mean, numbers obviously like they have significance, but at the end of the day, um, if I can live an approach to especially building a business online that isn't focused just on the numbers, but it's more focused on actually like doing things you enjoy. So like rather than, you know, going to make money on the Internet, you know, selling T-shirts or joining the latest Amazon program, actually instead focusing on what you like and trying to make that work to make money. That's a lot more important than making, you know, a certain income goal, a certain number of money a month. Um, but instead focusing on actually things that do matter a lot more, like your enjoyment of what you're doing and how you're doing or how you're making your money and what you're doing, uh, you know, whatever you're doing on the internet for. So that's kind of what yeah. I meant. Um, do, do, do you think that people can pursue what they enjoy and make money from it? And do you, or do you think that not everyone has that luxury to be able to do so? Uh, I think I think obviously not everyone is going to be able to necessarily do that specifically. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think work is work. Um, and I don't think, you know, everything has to be enjoyable. So I, even myself, I don't think everything is going to be enjoyable or super amazing and fun all the time. But I do think that people can take a different approach or more creative approach to um, maybe making an income. Uh, in line with something they maybe enjoy doing more than what they're doing now. Uh, so that's yeah. kind of the basis of where I stand. I don't think everybody's going to live their dream life or even if they do, it won't actually be their dream life. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough question to answer. And I don't think there is just uh, you know, a, a concise answer to it because everyone's going to range from what they want to do and you know, what their good life is. Yeah. Well, you see like the productivity going down, people doing quiet quitting and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. So I just, and now you have the the introduction of artificial intelligence as well. So I, I start to see and look at the landscape of how things are going. And I think the productivity levels are going to continue to decrease. And I don't know if, you know, the percentage of the people like me and you, you know, who actually like want to build value for society and actually do these sorts of types of things. I think that percentage is going to continue to decrease and de decrease, you know, over the course of time, mm -hmm. because I think people in general, majority of them aren't, aren't go-getters. You know, they, they just, you know, they'd rather eat a pizza and watch Netflix <laughs> than, you know, <laughs> hop on a podcast or, you know, mm -hmm. or build something of value like a newsletter or, you know, some kind of sustainable business model that actually provides value to people. I think people don't want to do the hard work to get that sort of result that they want but they actually just want the result you know without the hard yeah. work and I, I think that that's an issue too as well and uh, what, what's your take on the artificial intelligence landscape? because i think it's actually gonna with artificial intelligence i think it could eventually get to a point where you know people are leveraging it so much that cost basis is go down to zero like you look at education you look mm -hmm. at venture capital you look at business valuations you know, they're all going to go down and further down in terms of uh, uh, cost basis and what, what people are valuing actual companies as as well, because you can you can leverage the artificial intelligence eventually to have your own AI agents, you know, walking around, you know, doing doing yeah. sales calls for you and all these different types of things to sort of lower that cost. But what's your take on that? I think creativity could be at a premium moving forward uh, because of the fact that everything's going to be a lot of things are going to be artificially generated. Yeah, um, I agree. I think creativity is probably the one of one of the most important things. And in general, 
curiosity. So maybe people in the future won't actually have jobs. Um, I've kind of been toying with that idea a lot uh, because like, you know, robots could take all over all the mundane things, all the things like, you know, driving, making food, all those things. Um, I don't know when that's going to happen, but I think that artificial intelligence actually enables more people to do what they want to do. So in the topic of like, you know, enjoying what you do for a living or enjoying what you do every day, I think artificial intelligence takes away a lot of jobs, but it also pushes those people that are, don't have jobs anymore to do something that they actually want to do. Um, and that's probably the best thing I think is going to come from artificial intelligence. Although there's probably going to be some pretty nasty jumps in just like societal norms, because mm -hmm. now people may actually watch Netflix and eat pizza, but they can because they don't have to go to a job, right? Uh, yeah. So I don't know where everything's going to fall, but I think artificial intelligence is actually a very good thing for people who are problem solvers and take advantage of it because there's a lot of ways you can. Yeah, for sure. Are you, are you leveraging it right now for your business? Um, I use ChatGPT quite a bit, probably every day. And I definitely use like, I use Midjourney and all and some other AI tools in Photoshop now just to make thumbnails, make images pretty much every single day. So I definitely, I definitely leverage it right now um, in my business. You, you talk about being a solopreneur. Yeah. And uh, wh why do you like, why do you push towards being more a solopreneur as opposed to, you know, having a team sort of to divvy up the responsibility so you can have time to do other things and apply that time mm -hmm. to, to leverage other things to help the business uh, grow over time. Like, I'm just curious in regards to that mentality and that thought process. Yeah. So my, it's my personal preference, really. I mean, obviously someone else may want to run a team, but in my ideal scenario for life, I just have a business. I do things, you know, X amount of hours a day, and then I don't worry about it. If I have a team, I have other people to manage. There's a bunch of stressors that come with that. And I just don't want those. Someone else may want to take on that and grow their business further. I would rather stay at a lower level than grow and remain uh, by myself or working for myself and not managing people. And that's just what I prefer. And that's yeah. pretty much the only reason, right, that I would, that I'm doing that or I go that route. I think it's going to be more of a common thing too, because of, you know, artificial intelligence and mm -hmm. everything where people, like I said, are going to have these AI agents. And I think you'll see more and more solopreneurs for sure. Mm -hmm. And the cost to start a business has never been any lower than it is yeah, currently right now. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. So I think you're going to see a lot of, of businesses popping left and right from not only Western areas, because now, the internet infrastructure is now spreading, you know, to Southeast Asia. You look, you look at Africa, you look at Latin America. So because of that, a 15 year old eventually, you know, from, I don't know, Uganda, you know, mm -hmm. who has access to the internet could leverage an AI agent to build an entire company, you know? Yeah. And I think we'll eventually get to that point where, you know, it, it, it's going to be, you're going to have a point in time where people are going to be able to scale as solopreneurs to tens of millions of dollars, I think, you know, and I, I think also in, in conjunction with that too, as well, when you look at the landscape of content, again, I think that in my opinion, this is just my prediction. I think in the next 10 to 20 years, we could have our first ever trillionaire be a content creator. Yeah. You know, and, and this is, this is, this might sound crazy, but just, just, just bear with me. Right. So I'm thinking it from the landscape of the compounding effect of content, right? It starts off slow and then it compounds. And over the course of time, you establish more authority. Then you look at the amount of people there on the internet now, right? So there's currently around 4.5 billion people on the internet. So there, that pie continues to increase. The projection is 5.5 billion by 2030. Then by 2050, around 90 to 95% of people project it should be on the internet, right? As the infrastructure gets built out, you got things like WMT, Starlink, and, and these sorts of uh, companies that are building out the infrastructure for that. So if the pie continues to increase and you're continually, continuously compounding that authority over 5, 10, 15 years, mm -hmm. then you will, you will have an increase of probability to be able to attract more clients in the audience, right, as a, as a reciprocating result. Right. 
And so I think with that audience, because if you look at Mr. Beast, right? For instance, yeah, that's who I think of when you say exactly. That that's, like, that's the name yeah. that comes to mind, right? Yeah. <laughs> because when you when you look at Mr. Beast and you see that he's commanding a, a larger audience in some cases than you know uh, top tier, you know, like the Super Bowl and all these different types of things, mm -hmm. and he's he's doing more revenue than or doing more views than you know BBC News. And, you know, CNN, he does more views on a month to month basis than, than these huge conglomerates. Right. So what does that look like if he continues at the rate that he's going at with his team, with six or seven different channels running with all the different stuff that he has going on outside of YouTube AdSense? Right. You look at Beast Burgers, you look at merch, you look at all these different things. Then you look at the sponsorships. Well, because he's attracting so many eyeballs, well, he, the sponsors are going to have to pay more of a premium. Then you have a, a, a larger pool of sponsors coming with larger amounts of liquidity because they see the potential with all the eyeballs, right? And so with all of that in totality, with the added value of more and more people joining and discovering mm -hmm. his content and the algorithm pushing it, I think then we get to a point where he would, he would probably be, if, if I had to choose, he would probably be the first ever trillionaire from content. Yeah, I mean, something like that would probably be um, the most likely, right, to actually get there. Because even right now, I see it um, like PewDiePie, Mr. Beast, whoever else, anyone with all this attention on platform has like infinite amounts more leverage than like news, like you said, news, news conglomerates and other people who are like teams are like hundreds of people. Uh, right. So, yeah, I think it could be possible. I don't know if it's going to be the first trillionaire but like if anyone's going to make it from content um and get like really far into making you know a lot more money than what was before the years before mm -hmm. like people content creators 10 years ago definitely made a lot less than they do today um and it's mm -hmm. probably only going to grow especially as creativity blossoms because it's needed to and ai is kind of like taking over the other mundane things Yes, exactly. That's 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 the thing, because I think AI is actually going to serve as a catalyst for people to want more content, because imagine if I see a business that's working, that's now starting to make revenue and I can just ask my AI agent to create the same business and just slap on a different form of branding and marketing. Well, the branding and marketing is going to now be at a premium and part of the marketing is content creation. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the uniqueness of the brand, the uniqueness of the content that I'm putting out is what's going to differentiate me from someone else who's, who has the same copy and paste format. And I think that you look at, if you look at it from the blockchain perspective, right? When you look at, you know, uh, one chain launching another chain, just copy and pasting the code. And then, you know, and then the same with the decentralized applications. Oh, we're going to be the, U the uni swap of Cardano. We're going to be the mm -hmm. uni swap of AVAX. And we're going to, you know, and so you see the same type of thing happening, but the only different differentiating factor is really the branding and the marketing aspect, right? The tech infrastructure, yes, is slightly nuanced. If you look at it from separation between the EVM chain, like an AVAX or a Ethereum versus like a UTXO model, like a, like a Cardano versus a, um, um, well, Cardano's EUTXO, right? The UTXO mm -hmm. model is the, is the Bitcoin model, right? So yes, the, the tech infrastructure is different. But how many retail know about the tech infrastructure and how many care as long as their coins are moving from point A to point B, they're able to participate in De DeFi. Do they really care? This is the thing I always I always think and question. Will they care in the future? Because we see these things where you, you got meme coins, you got the the highest performing asset in the shortest duration of time in Pepe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 23 days it became a billion, a billion dollars in market value, right? Market capitalization, right? In 23 days so you have these 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 things happening in a bear market and i don't think that they slow down i think that people are going to decide separately on what they they value and sometimes it's not necessarily the tech per se i think i think sometimes it's just the community yeah. it's the it's the facade it's the marketing it's the branding you know and i don't know what, what do you think about this uh, I I agree. I think some things are pretty ludicrous, and I don't think that a lot of like what's going to be worth a lot of money um, is going to be perceived as valuable. I guess in like traditional means at all. 
uh, like you know, meme coins, whatever they actually proceed, whatever they actually bring as value, um, probably isn't worth billions of dollars, but it is. So, uh, I mean, and people are still, you know, paying money for these tokens, maybe with the expectation of making more money, um, pretty much always, but still people are interested, right? People are engaged and people are still around in some capacity. Yeah. And I think also meme coins indirectly kind of help a little bit the ecosystem. Like, I don't know, Cardano trading volume was kind of dead before Snack popped up and then mm -hmm. started doing what it was doing. Um, so I find them, I find them super fascinating, interesting and memes could potentially be the if, if for instance because if you look at memes right memes are kind of like the the big thing in the internet right and now that we can transact with them could they one day become a form of internet money <laughs> you know <laughs> that's like that's like i don't know i don't know i don't know the yeah. answer but i just see the way that stuff is going and i i I, I know it has no utility, but at the same time, I don't think people care anymore. I think people just want to just want to garner around community and ideology, you know, and yeah. it also take, it ties back a little bit to crypto tribalism. I don't know. Like for me, I find crypto tribalism a, a bit strange. It's almost like sports, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like different it's like, sports teams. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't really understand it. But do you think it goes away, the crypto tribalism? Uh, probably not. Uh, at some level, it's always going to be there. People are, you know, have vested interests. And especially when it's a lot of money, um, people are even more, you know, intrigued to defend their positions because they have to defend their own convictions. So I don't think it's going to go away, but I think it's going to matter less and less as things progress and as, you know, things show themselves useful or not useful. Yeah, for sure, for sure, man. Let, let's talk a little bit more about business because, um, in regards to to, um, because I'm wondering, like, are you operating as a business or are you just operating as a freelancer? Like, are you registered at LLC or how has that process been like for you? And uh, you know, like, just walk me through, like, how are you you attracting clients? Are you just using the content marketing from YouTube? Like, how are you? Like, what are you doing exactly? Um. So. I actually am registered as a corporation just because when I made um, quite a bit of money in 2021, if I wasn't registered as a corporation, I would have uh, been in the hole. Technically, I would have lost money, even though I made a bunch of money uh, just from taxes and the price of crypto going down. So instead of taking a 50% uh, tax rate, I took a 12% tax rate by forming a corporation. And ever since then, all of my money to the corporation, even though in the last little bit, it hasn't been that much money in earnings. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah, I've been using YouTube, obviously my authority on YouTube and in this space to land freelance clients, but I've kind of stopped taking on freelance work and trying to focus on building something more lasting and that I enjoy. Uh, obviously with that comes a pay cut, but yeah, I do have a corporation. If you make like over a certain amount of money, you're probably going to want a corporation, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it's a necessary requirement, especially to start a business. Obviously you don't need a corporation until you actually have a reason to like a tax reason usually uh yeah. but yeah that that's just what i've done and that's what i'm doing now what kind of freelance work are you doing um so when i did freelance work it was just uh basically like you know tutorials for web apps and just like tutorial videos in general on how to use someone's application so i worked with like cardano marketplaces like jpeg store I did a bunch of work for them um all of their youtube videos are pretty much done by me and then like other nft projects will come on and ask me to cover like development updates or stuff like that and put it together in a video voiceover all that good stuff um mm -hmm. and just kind of work like that just basically whatever projects need video content or tutorials i will help them with it and yeah. that's just basically what i did especially in like the web3 realm um, a lot of people need people to make videos for them or to like cover their things or showcase their updates. And that's just what I did. Yeah. 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 That's really, really good. I actually do some of that too as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's actually, it's actually quite lucrative. Um, especially if you have the networks and stuff like that, mm -hmm. it can be uh pretty lucrative, you know, there's, there's a million different ways to skin a cat. Right. But yeah. when, when you talk about building something long lasting, what is your vision for your solopreneurship in the next five to 10 years? What, what do you plan to, to, to build? What do you plan to evolve within that time frame? 
Uh, so five to 10 years is quite a while, though. I usually don't, I'd say, think that far. I mean, to generalize, in five to 10 years, I want to be um, every day working on something that inspires me, makes me feel, makes me feel fulfilled and is enjoyable and also, you know, making more money. Uh, so I can also follow up with those other things in other ways other than work. Uh, but right now, building something lasting really just means um, writing every day and building a newsletter uh, a lot and also just building a platform outside of YouTube, outside of whatever, that's based on not just crypto, not just um, one thing, but my interest and whatever really I'm curious about in a way that can also help other people. And that's like the whole gist of it. I don't have uh, a miraculous like goal for how much money I want to make uh, or anything like that. It's just that I want to focus on that path rather than like, you know, making a certain amount of money path or um, mm. yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Do, do you, do you travel or have a social life? Like what do you? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I am going on vacation next month uh, to the Dominican, but pretty much all my work I can do from a laptop. I don't have a laptop or have like a tiny laptop, but um, <laughs> I can do it from my phone too. Right. If it's not, if it's not like video editing, like any yeah. writing things, I can do it all from my phone. Uh, I have a girlfriend, so I go outside with her. That's like pretty much all I do um, outside of work is just hanging out with my girlfriend. Um, but that's, yeah, that's basically it. My social life is mostly just hanging out uh, with like two people, my friends, two friends I have. Uh, and yeah, I mostly though, I'm at this computer right here sitting on my keyboard. Uh, <laughs> like that's most of my day, but now it's been nice out. So I go outside too. Nice. How, how old are you? uh 23 23, 23. yeah man young man you got you got plenty of time the thing is about the cool thing about entrepreneurship too the earlier you start the more the the skills and the, and the learning lessons compound and so yeah. you don't make the same mistake twice you know it's the same in investing you know like when the next bull run comes we'll be like oh we've, we've seen that before you know yeah. <laughs> oh oh another uh mint and burn stable coin uh okay <laughs> you know but yeah, yeah, it's 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 quite interesting, man, to uh, to to hear you, you know, to be at this mindset and this uh, at the age that you're at, you know, that's mm -hmm. it's not a lot of people. I'm sure you can't connect with a lot of people at your age range because I don't think a lot of people have the same mindset. Uh, yeah, us usually not. I usually don't talk to people uh, based on their age, just like talk to them if they have the same kind of ideals or kind of topics that are interested to me. And usually, yeah, those people are like, you know, at least like 26 to like, you know, 40. So yeah. <laughs> it, it is different, especially in person. Like um, I went to an event for NFTs, like everyone there who I talked to was like, you know, at least 10 years older than me, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. 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 It's crazy. And um, my final question before we go. So where do you see the crypto space in the next five to 10 years? Do you see it lasting? Do you see most of the projects going to zero? Just what do you see the, the landscape? And also when you see, when you take a look at all of the different technological advancements that are happening simultaneously right now, you look at VR, AR, robotics, artificial intelligence, blockchain, all kind of intermingling together and moving sort of at a rapid speed in terms of uh, pace and in innovation. Where do you see that within the next five to 10 years in regards to that and also with blockchain technology in general? Uh, so ideally, hopefully, crypto is mixed in with ai and other systems to make a more convenient and controllable experience for just people out there in the world um, and it's useful right that's ideal in five ten years i do think that many parts of crypto will be useful and integrated into uh wh whatever comes up with ai because five to ten years is a long time and the world can be drastically different in that time especially at the rate of evolution right now um so Ideally, what I would see, hope to see and what I think is very possible is basically a place where crypto is integrated as payments that are enabled to be authorized by AI. Um, and it, because like to me, that makes sense. Crypto tokens and all these things that are really in your control um, to give them or to give AI the authority to use those tokens. Um, it seems easier than you know having a payment payment processor and all these other things that are like boundaries around what you can do, but rather crypto is like a permissionless way to actually spend your money um, yeah. or use your money. So I think it integrates well with future technology. I'm not exactly sure how in all of the ways and metrics, 
But I think that's like one of the big plays is that it's adopted into the new technology that's forming and not just, you know, replacing the old systems. Jack, it's been amazing, man. Uh, this has been a very, very lovely conversation with you. Where can people find you on the internet? Um, on Twitter at Jack Fricks and at Frickit.net. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much the two places. Um, anywhere else, you may not see me there. You may see me there. But yeah, those two places for sure. <laughs> Awesome, man. Let's do this again, you know, later down the line, man, and just get updates on you, your business, where everything's going. And it's been lovely, man. I really appreciate this conversation, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah. All right, man. This has been another amazing episode, guys, and peace.